morning, bright and early. Um, I wanted to just to say again, welcome uh, to our last day at Time to Thrive. I don't know if you've been paying attention to um, online news, but Time to Thrive is kind of trending out there right now, which is really awesome because the individuals that aren't here are learning about that this exists and there's resources out there available for them to be advocates back in their community. I'm really honored to introduce to you uh, someone that will be moderating a panel of individuals who flew in from Washington, D.C., who represent d diverse or uh, various U.S. federal agencies to talk specifically about what the U.S. federal government is doing with, uh, in regards to this issue and also some resources. They will be answering questions and we're going to get started right away. So make sure you get your coffee. There's plenty of food It'll be back there. Um, but before I introduce our moderator, can, I don't know if you noticed, there's several high school and middle school students joining us today, and they're going to be still coming in. And I just, for those of you who are already here, can we just give a round of applause for the high school students and middle school students who are joining us today? Thank you so much for being here. And I just want to let those young people know that there were just over 600 youth-serving professionals, educators, counselors, pediatricians, social workers who spent their entire three days here learning about how to best and better support LGBT young people in their communities. So thank you. Moderating this panel is our friend and White House advisor, Gautam Raghavan. In his role, he serves as President Obama's liaison to the LGBT and, Amer and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Gautam also served as Deputy White House Liaison to the U.S. Department of Defense and in 2010 as Outreach Lead for the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Working Group. He also worked for the Progressive Majority, the Democratic National Committee under Chairman Howard Dean, and the 2008 Obama campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend, Gautam Raghavan. Good morning, everybody. All right, I like to hear that. That's a good response. Um, it is great to be here. Again, my name is Gautam Raghavan, and I work at the White House Office of Public Engagement as Director of LGBT Outreach. And um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, you've heard this all weekend. I know for, for many of you, it wasn't just about giving up Valentine's Day or President's your long weekend. Um, but I know for some of you, it was also um, giving up the opportunity to watch season two of House of Cards, um, which uh, started on, uh, on Friday or Saturday. I lost track of time. Um, and I'm here on behalf of everyone in Washington, D.C., especially those of us who work in the federal government, to let you know that it's nothing like that in real life, um, nor is it like Scandal or Veep or even the West Wing. Um, for me, quite candidly, it's really mostly like The Amazing Race, which is that we have a limited amount of time, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but the end is worth the journey. So it's been an amazing experience to be able to work for this administration and for this president. And to open things up, I'm very pleased to introduce um, a quick video message from my boss, Valerie Jarrett, who is unable to be here. She serves as senior advisor to President Obama um, and has been truly a champion for the LGBT community as well as for, uh, for young people everywhere. And she wanted to share some of her thoughts with you. So with that, let's go ahead and roll the tape. Well, hello, everyone. I so wish I could be there with you tonight. I'm sure you're having a great time, and no doubt it's a lot warmer in Las Vegas than it is here in D.C. I want to take a quick moment to extend thanks on behalf of President Obama for your continued leadership in promoting and fostering environments across our country where all young people can thrive. All of our children deserve to go to school and live their lives free of the physical, emotional, and psychological harm that comes from bullying. And I especially want to say to all the young people in the audience, thank you for your courage and your willingness to stand up for what you know is right. As the President has often said, bullying is not a rite of passage. It's wrong, and we can bring it to an end, but it does not get better on its own. We have to make it better. That's why the Obama administration has issued guidance to schools, colleges and universities, making it clear that existing civil rights laws do, in fact, apply to bullying. 
It's not just a moral responsibility of our schools, but their legal responsibility to protect our young people from harassment. We have also worked with states to help them in their own anti-bullying efforts. That's why we've issued guidance to the governors and the state school officials to help them incorporate best practices for protecting their students. We relaunched StopBullying.gov, a website that contains detailed descriptions of the work we're doing on bullying, along with resources for young people, parents, and educators. And the departments of education and justice have reached landmark settlements in Minnesota and California after extensive investigations into bullying and harassments against students who are or who are perceived to be LGBT. The harm that stems from bullying cuts in every direction. It's bad for the bullied, it's harmful for bullies, and it can poison communities and educational environments for all. There's so much more I could mention, but I'm not going to steal the thunder from some of my colleagues from across the Obama administration who you'll be hearing from in person and who will go into more detail. So in closing, let me say this. I know that there are tough days, days when it is easy to lose heart, days when change isn't happening nearly fast enough. But I urge you not to rest, not to tire, and certainly don't give up because young people in every community across this country are counting on us. Please keep up the great work in raising awareness and accountability on this vital issue. You can rest assured that the President of the United States is in your corner, and both he and his administration will be with you every step of the way. I'm eager to hear how the conference goes, and my team and I look forward to partnering with you in the years to come. Enjoy the rest of your day. So before I bring out our, our panel um, of some of my tremendous colleagues from across the administration, I just wanted to say a couple of quick things um, about what this panel is and, and how we in the administration think about this issue. And I think the first thing to, to stress is really to underscore something that Valerie said, which is that this is something that is personally important to the president. I think not just because of his commitment to uh, equality for the LGBT community, but also because I think for him and for the First Lady, for the Vice President, for Dr. Biden, for a number of folks in the, in the White House and across the administration, um, that they strongly believe in the value of education for young people. And so this is a personal commitment. I think this is also something that um, is not just limited to the work that is being done at the Department of Education or Department of Justice. It's really across the administration. You're going to hear a little bit about that today. Um, and I think that's something that's important to stress, that this is uh, broader than just bullying prevention. It's now about how do we empower all of, our, uh, all of our young people so that they have the opportunity to thrive in the classroom and in, and in communities around the country. And the last thing I would say is that, um, you know, we spend a lot of time in D.C. obviously on policy and guidance and that kind of thing, but quite frankly, none of it matters without all of you. And so we really try to prioritize these sorts of opportunities, which is to connect federal policy with folks who are on the ground and actually doing the work that matters. Um, the, the fact is that, you know, announcing a new policy or, or issuing guidance doesn't mean anything if it's not being implemented on the ground the right way. And so we want to be here as a resource to you. And to that, uh, to that extent, we're going to try to limit how much we say in our opening remarks so we have the opportunity to take questions from all of you, since I know you're probably eager to, to engage with all of us. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring out our panelists. Um, and first, uh, but not, uh, first on the list is uh, Michael Yudin, who is Acting Assistant Secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services at the U.S. Department of Education. Michael, come on up. Next is Aaron Rainey, who is director, and by the way, I apologize, we have very long titles in the administration, who's director of the Injury and Violence Prevention Programs in the Division of Ch Child, Adolescent, and Family Health at the Health Resources and Services Administration. Aaron, thank you for being here. Next is Brian Altman, who is legislative director for SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Brian, thank you. And finally, Ashley Davis, who is Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA. Ashley, thank you for being here. All right, so now I'm moving to the table. Um, 
And what I want to do first is to is actually to ask Aaron to um, to open up the conversation and frame for us uh, and give us the history of what's uh, been the, what we call the federal partners in bullying prevention and how this administration and how the government is approaching bullying prevention from sort of a multifaceted angle. So, Aaron, please. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks for being here. This is early for Vegas, so we're really happy to see you. Um, I'm going to kick off our panel, as Adam said, with a brief overview of kind of the history of how the federal government has worked to address bullying prevention um, and also share a few free resources that hopefully will help community leaders like yourselves in translating some of the best practices to action when you leave here today. Um, I'm representing the Health Resources and Services Administration, that's called HRSA for short, and we're an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. We began our work in bullying in 2001. That's when we began uh, our work to develop the Stop Bullying Now campaign. Is anyone out there familiar with the Stop Bullying Now campaign? That's great, I see some hands, wonderful. Um, one of our primary objectives with Stop Bullying Now was to raise awareness about bullying and to really push the idea that, as you heard Valerie Jarrett say, as you've heard the president say, bullying is not just a rite of passage. Um, we began to see research tying being bullied to reduced academic outcomes and to reduced health uh, impact. And so we said we need to take this seriously. And over the years of working on that campaign, we also began to see the research unfold that youth who are LGBT or perceived even to be LGBT were also at increased risk to be bullied. And so that's why it's so great to see the human rights campaign taking leadership on this issue and hosting this conference. Um, this is absolutely an issue of importance. Um, and again, really happy to be here. So as we've worked to raise awareness about the, the risks that LGBT youth face when it comes to bullying, we've worked closely with partners like the Trevor Project, the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network, GLSEN. These are names that you've seen a lot this weekend. Um, and we want to make sure that what we are producing from the federal level is useful to the LGBT community. Um, for example, uh, every year we work with GLSEN to promote No, no Name Calling Week and to really uh, raise awareness about verbal bullying and harassment. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years, and we were a part of that initiative from the beginning, including supporting the inaugural research report um, that was gathered from those very first folks who jumped on board with that campaign. Um, what I'm really, really happy to say is that we've seen bullying indeed rise as a hot topic, and awareness is at a perhaps even all-time high right now, um, but what that means is that a lot more people are at the table. So I'm so proud to sit here and talk to you about some of the federal partnership efforts that are going on um, and, and so how we're working together to try to serve the best that we can the public. So as you've heard, in March of 2011, we launched StopBullying.gov. I hope you've all been there. This is our one-stop shop for all federal resources on bullying prevention. Uh, the Departments of Health and Human Services, education and justice work collaboratively to put every word of content on that site. We work together on that. We work to identify gaps. We try to make sure that we're on the cutting edge and, and again, meeting the needs. Um, let me tell you about three updates that have happened on that site in the last maybe year. First of all, my colleagues at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, led an effort to develop media guidelines for how you would cover bullying um, in your reporting or perhaps even in entertainment media in a way that would not be um, harmful, potentially harmful to, to viewers and readers. And that's in our newsroom on StopBullying.gov. We had the Department of Justice who led a, an effort to develop a youth engagement toolkit. I heard there might be some youth in the audience today, which is great. Um, that toolkit, yeah, let's give a hand for the youth. I know it's early for you guys too, so welcome and glad you're here. That little toolkit, it's, it's quite simple, but it, it really encourages youth to talk to each other, to come together and to watch, for example, um, so, some kind of, something that will spark your energy in thinking about bullying, such as the Cartoon Network documentary called Stop Bullying, Speak Up. And then there are discussion guides in that, in that youth engagement toolkit to really try to encourage youth to talk to each other around solutions and how to stop bullying. And finally, uh, I wanna talk about some of the work from HRSA Last month, we launched a training center on StopBullying.gov. 
And there you're going to find uh, HRSA's tr Bullying Training Module and Community Action Toolkit. This is a relatively new resource. Um, it's basically designed to summarize the latest science around bullying, the best practices from the research that we think we know will work, and provide some ideas for next steps on how to take that great information forward to your community. And as we move from awareness to action on bullying prevention and begin to establish programs and policies and practices and protocols, making sure that those are infused with the best practices that we know out there. And we're not advancing um, ineffective techniques to try to stop bullying. So you can find that on stopbullying.gov slash training. You're also going to find the Department of Education's great training resources there um, for teachers in the classroom, as well as school bus drivers, which is an important key player here. So I hope, I hope you've seen all of those. Finally, let me tell you that we're not stopping there. Um, we are working to promote those best practices, but we know that it's time to begin thinking about what's next in the field of bullying prevention. So HRSA is working with the Institute of Medicine to host a two-day public workshop coming up in March. Um, the purpose of this, um, to convene experts in the field, to summarize the state of evidence around what works, and to inform a multidisciplinary roadmap for the next frontier in bullying and prevention. I, I want to let you know that the focus is broadened now beyond stopping bullying, which is critical, central, but we're also looking at how do you boost resilience of youth who are being targeted. Um, we really believe strongly that we need to come at this from both angles, and so we think that this IOM uh, workshop will be a first step in, in looking at that. I invite all of you to uh, observe that. I do believe it will be live streaming. Um, forgive me, but the best way to stay in tune on that is to Google IOM bullying. Uh, forgive me, but it really is the easiest. There's a website, and you can see the, the streaming link there. So finally, um, just want to say that we all have a unique role to play on this issue. The federal partners in bullying prevention are actively working together on a very regular basis to try to make sure that we're, we're um, synergistic and meeting the needs that you all have in the field. We're, in fact, working very actively right now to plan our next federal summit on bullying prevention, which we are hopeful will take place uh, this fall. So we will see how that turns out. And at this time, I want to turn it over to Michael Uden, who can talk to you a little bit more about the great work going on at the Department of Education. Excuse me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. How are y'all? Good. Hope you're having a great, great conference. I want to thank Vinny and HRC for, for putting on this critically important conference. I know it's absolutely making a difference in the lives of kids around the country. Um, I especially want to thank the, the, the folks that are here today, the educators, the counselors, uh, those that provide supports and services to, to kids every single day. Thank you for, for your leadership and your commitment and your dedication to making sure that we're doing everything we can to keep kids safe. And finally, I just want to thank the kids that are here, the young people that are here. You guys are our leaders. You're leading the way. You know, I had the chance to... <laughs> The young man that, that, that spoke yesterday, and he's, he's now in college, and he was bullied in school, and he's just so articulate. I was like, man, this kid is going to be leading stuff. It's just really, really amazing. So, so thank you for everything that you do, and uh, I really look forward to, to hearing from all of you um, in, the, in the coming years. So at the Department of Education, you know, one of our primary missions is to make sure that all kids, all kids graduate from high school with a set of skills, with the education and the skills to be successful in college and careers. To have the skills to be successful in this 21st century knowledge-based economy. And frankly, if a kid isn't safe or doesn't feel safe or isn't thriving, then they're not going to achieve. They're not going to be as successful as we need them to be. You know, my office, I'm in the Office of Special Ed and Rehab Services, and we provide supports and services to states and, and communities all around the country to make sure that the millions of kids with disabilities around the country also have the opportunities and the supports that they need to be successful and graduate from high school 
college and career ready. And in my office, we've identified a set of values that just guide our work, inform the work that we do. Those values are inclusion, equity, and opportunity. Promoting inclusion, ensuring equity, and creating opportunity. And that is the, the, the foundation of, of the work that we do every day. So we know that LGBT kids in particular have challenges in, in schools. There are challenges to feeling safe, to challenges to, to, to thriving. And it is indeed time to thrive. So we've done a lot in, in over the last few years. And I'm going to try to talk to you about some of the, the, the initiatives and the efforts that we've moved forward with that I think can actually be helpful to you. That if you're aware of, this is what the law says. This is what the United States Department of Education says are the obligations of school districts. These are the resources, this is the policy, these are the tools that you can use to make sure that every kid in your school is safe and is thriving. So I'm going to kind of talk for a few minutes about some of these, and we can certainly get into more detail, go on our website, get more information. But I think most importantly, not most importantly, but, but significantly, um, we've issued policy guidance to states and, and uh, to states and local school districts and colleges and educators all around the country um, that apply to bullying. And this guidance is in the form of what we call a dear colleague letter. And it's our dear colleague. So dear colleague, dear superintendent, dear state superintendent, dear professor, dear teacher, dear, you know, it's a dear colleague. And this dear colleague really sets forth the policy and guidance to schools and what their obligations are under the federal laws with regards to bullying. And what the, their obligations are under the law with regards to harassment and anti-discrimination. So as you know, you can't discriminate on the basis of race and national origin, gender and disability. This guidance lays out how that applies to bullying and how that applies to LGBT kids. So Title IX of the Civil Rights Laws does not cover discrimination based solely on sexual orientation. The law does not do that. But it does apply to discrimination based on an individual's failure to conform to sex stereotypes. So what this guidance says is you cannot discriminate, you cannot per uh, permit harassment to individuals in the, that face the kind of bullying that LGBT students face based on, at least in part, on the student's nonconformance with gender stereotypes. So that Title IX kind of bullying is sex discrimination, and it is, in fact, covered by Title IX. So for those of you in this room working to create safer schools, school, safer school environments for LGBT youth, it's critical to know that harassment that is targeting LGBT students, including anti-gay comments, or based in part on a student's actual or perceived sexual orientation, does not relieve a school of its obligation under Title IX to investigate and remedy sexual or gender-based harassment. So since then, this is really important, right? So since then, we have actually used this guidance at, at the department, in the Department of Education, our Office for Civil Rights, the Department of Justice, to negotiate robust remedies around the country where LGB students have, in fact, been subjected to harassment on the basis of sex stereotypes. To just give two examples, the Department of Justice, Department of Education investigated complaints, and Valerie Jarrett mentioned these in, in her remarks just briefly, that the uh, learning environment in school districts in Tehachapi, California, and Okahannepin, Minnesota, were unsafe and unwelcoming for students who did not conform to gender stereotypes, including LGBT youth. These investigations resulted in groundbreaking, groundbreaking settlement agreements detailing how these districts and school districts across the country can do a better job of protecting LGBT youth and other students from harassment. It's a really, really critical tool. In 2013, the department, the, both the Department of Justice and the Department of Education entered into a first-of-its-kind settlement agreement with the Arcadia Unified School District in California to resolve allegations of discrimination against a male transgender student. The district <coughs> previously had prohibited the student from accessing the facilities consistent with his male gender identity, including the restrooms and locker rooms at school, overnight accommodations on school trips. 
Under this agreement, the district agreed to treat the student like other male students in all education programs and activities offered by the district and to adopt policies and procedures to ensure a non-discriminatory school environment for all students. It's a really big deal. They were able to use this guidance to come to these agreements and do a better job of protecting kids around their, around their districts. Another key, key piece of, of guidance that we put out a couple of years ago we issued legal guidance around the Equal Access Act, which requires public schools to afford equal treatment to all non-curricular student organizations, including Gay Straight Alliances and other groups that focus on issues related to LGB LGBT students, sexual orientation, or gender identity. So officials don't have to endorse any particular organization, but what we say is that the federal law requires that they afford all student groups the same opportunities to form, convene on school grounds and have access to the same resources available to other student groups. Another example, this past August in my office, Office of Special Ed, we, we issued guidance clarifying a school district's responsibility under IDEA, which is the federal law that, that provides supports and services to kids with disabilities, to the millions of kids with disabilities. And into this, under this guidance, we clarified that a bullying of a student with a disability, and as, as you may know, Students with disabilities are disproportionately subject to bullying, as other, as other targeted groups are. And if this uh, bullying results in the student not receiving a meaningful educational benefit, results in the loss of a meaningful educational benefit because the kid is being bullied, that results in the denial of FAPE, which is a free appropriate public education which school districts are required under the law to provide to kids with disabilities a free and appropriate public education. So if the kid is bullied and it results in, a, in the loss of a meaningful educational benefit, that would be a denial of a free appropriate public education. I gotta tell you, I was talking to a parent advocate a couple of weeks ago and she told me she got this guidance and she's taken it around to school districts around the country, a parent, a parent advocate is using this guidance to help make sure that their kids are safe. Um, just this year, Ed and the Department of Justice, we issued a school discipline guidance package. And this is really important. This isn't necessarily about bullying, but it's about making sure that our schools are safe and positive, healthy school climates. We know that students of color, students with disabilities, and LGBT youth are disproportionately subject to discipline practices that exclude them from the classroom that takes them out of the classroom. They are disproportionately subject to those kinds of practices. We actually know that kids that are taken from the classroom, that have more referrals to the juvenile justice system, end up in, in, in juvenile justice and, and, in, and in corrections. There is a direct pipeline to prison for too many of these kids. And all you gotta do is look at the data. We know that, that that the percent, you know, LGBT youth make up about 15% of kids in correctional facilities. That is disproportionate. That is crazy. So what this guidance does is really, really important, uh, describing how schools can meet their obligations under federal law to administer student discipline without discriminating on the basis of race, color, or national origin. It, it provides um, best practices and guiding principles to help states and local school districts improve their school climate. The three key principles are taking deliberate steps to create positive school climates that can help prevent and change inappropriate behavior. Ensure that clear, appropriate, and consistent expectations and consequences are in place to prevent and address, and address misbehavior. And ensure fairness and equity for all students by continuously evaluating the implement of their discipline policies and practices on all students using data. These guiding principles outline the action steps schools should take to create positive school climates that safeguard all students, including LGBT youth. Examples, setting high expectations for student behavior, clarifying that harassing and bullying will not be tolerated, while implementing alternatives to suspension and expulsion to prevent and address such behaviors. Equipping personnel to handle students' misconduct fairly, equitably, and without regard to a student's personal characteristics such as gender identity and sexual orientation. And we also provided a, a great uh, amount of resources to help schools create safe and positive and healthy learning environments. And you can get all of that information on our website at the Department of Ed. I'm, I'm gonna spend 
my last couple of minutes, I know I'm probably going over my time, so I'll be really brief. We have a tool at the department in our Office for Civil Rights called the Civil Rights Data Collection. This is a really, really critical piece, of, a critical tool for us because it provides not only the departments with the tools to enforce civil rights laws, but it provides stakeholders and advocates around the country with the information and the data they need to address civil rights violations. For 2013-14, our data collection, all school districts will have the option in this year of submitting the number of reported allegations of harassment on the basis of sexual orientation and religion in addition to the required categories of race, color, national origin, sex, and disability. Next year, they will have to, have to submit harassment data for religion and sexual orientation. So every school district is going to have to report data on the harassment for students based on sexual orientation. This is a really, really big deal. Um, so we're not collecting separately on gender identity, but we will expand the definition of sex-based bullying and harassment to clarify that this includes students harassed on the basis of gender nonconformity. Um, you know, this, this administration is absolutely committed to it. I've, I've you know, got them talked about, you know, the president and Valerie Jarrett talked about the president. I can tell you Arnie Duncan, Eric Holder, the attorney general, they are absolutely committed to this. We've done, it gets better videos. You can check, the, the president has done them, Arnie has done them. We've all done them. It's really um, amazing to be a part of an administration that is doing everything it can. And it's not just like, all right, we did this, let's check the box and move off. This is a continued, continued commitment. At the end of the day, safe schools not only free from physical violence or drug abuse, but they work to proactively support, engage, and include everyone. And we know too well that LGBT youth too often don't have the opportunities to, to learn and thrive. Um, you know, we can make all the policy in the world, but at the end of the day, it's you guys that take those tools, take the resources, leverage everything you can to make a difference and make sure that kids are safe. So, thank you. Thanks, Michael. So before we move on to our other two um, panelists, I did want to mention that if you want to ask a question, we'll have a, a, obviously a Q&A period, but I also encourage you to just tweet it at us. And so you can use the hashtag time to thrive um, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on those and we'll uh, try to get to those first. It makes it a little bit easier, you don't have to get out of your chair. But for those of you who don't tweet, don't worry, we can always get you a microphone. Um, to the point that Aaron made at the opening, this is really um, about an effort that is broader than just preventing bullying. And so I'm so glad that both, uh, both Brian and Ashley can be here to talk about what their agencies are doing. So first I want to ask Brian to say a few words about what SAMHSA has been doing in terms of family acceptance and mental health services. Please. Thanks, Adam, and thanks for everyone who's uh, here and um, the sponsors, uh, HRC, as well the co-lead sponsors, NEA and of course my former employer, American Counseling Association. So <laughs> thanks, Rich. Um, so I, <laughs> on behalf of Administrator Pam Hyde, one of the, the administration's leading LGBT um, spokespeople, I'm pleased to be here today. Administrator Hyde and I both grew up in a time and a place where coming out of the closet for many people was a risky proposition. While we were both very lucky that our families were highly supportive, we know that many, many others in our communities I'm from Oklahoma, um, we're not so fortunate. <laughs> All right, go Sooners. While we were uh, both, uh, so despite the great progress that LGBT uh, citizens have made in our nation in recent years, we know that not all families are as accepting of their loved one's sexual orientation or gender identity. I hope that many of you got to see the movie Families Are Forever last night by Dr. Caitlin Ryan. She, she has done some tremendous research uh, over the past several years and is now, um, especially here today with this document I'm about to release, um, turning that research into concrete practice. And at SAMHSA, we recognize the value of her work for many years, and that is why we uh, uh, asked her to work with us to develop um, what we have now created as a practitioner's resource guide helping families support their LGBT children. So each year, the secretary of HHS, Kathleen Sebelius, uh, seeks the guidance of her department's LGBT coordinating council. There's actually a group from every staff and operating division within HHS that gathers together once a month to talk about LGBT issues. And each year, the secretary issues a report on what the agency has accomplished and what they intend to accomplish over the next year. So uh, SAMHSA was tasked with three items 
um, from June 2013 to June 2014. And I'm pleased to say that with the release of this document today, we've accomplished um, one of those objectives. So the resource guide is now available on our website, samhsa.gov, for you and all of your colleagues to utilize. We hope that it provides an easy to read summary of the Family Acceptance Project's research findings and provides very specific steps that practitioners like yourselves can take to proactively engage families and work with them and their LGBT children and adolescents. So SAMHSA is pleased to have supported and published this resource guide because we know that not only a disproportionate number of LGBT individuals have behavioral health conditions, but that specifically research from the Family Acceptance Project indicates that LGBT young adults who reported high levels of family rejection during adolescence were 8.4 times more likely to have attempted suicide, 5 point times more likely to report high levels of depression, 3.4 three time, times more likely to use illegal drugs, and 3.4 times more likely to report having engaged in unprotectual sexual intercourse compared to their peers from families who had high um, or to have no or low levels of family rejection. So there's a direct relationship between families that support their children and their overall be behavioral health and well-being. And so in order to work on um, having the best behavioral health and well-being of a child, it's important that the family accept their child. So we also know that this document is important to have now because there's more widespread access to information about sexual orientation, gender identity, and LGBT resources exist through the internet and through other media, that there's been significant changes in how children and adolescents learn about LGBT, LGBT people and their lives. And increasingly, this means that young people come out at much earlier ages than prior generations of LGBT individuals, such as Administrator Hyde and myself. So coming out at earlier ages has important implications for practitioners, such as yourself, who work with children, youth, and families, and how they educate parents, families, and caregivers about sexual orientation and gender identity, and how those services are provided to LGBT children and adolescents. Historically, the Family Acceptance Project has found that services for LGBT youth and later transgender youth were developed to actually protect them from harm, including rejecting parents and families that were perceived as rejecting or incapable of supporting their sexual minority children. As a result, services evolved over decades to serve LGBT adolescents either individually, one-on-one, -on -one, like adults, or through peer support, children, talking, children and adolescents talking to each other, but not necessarily in the context of their families. And so that's so why it's so important for practitioners in many fields that interact with LGBT youth and their families to know and understand that families of LGBT youth play a critical role in reducing risk and promoting well-being in those young people, particularly during the coming out process. The resource guide also ensures that practitioners know that supportive families can help protect LGBT youth against suicidal behavior, and that even families that are very rejecting of their LGBT youth at the beginning can learn to modify their behaviors to be more supportive of their LGBT children. And that there is a powerful relationship between a family member's words, actions, and behaviors, and their children's risk and well-being. At SAMHSA, our mission is to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on America's communities. And we believe that armed with the information about the importance of family acceptance and how to engage LGBT families with their youth, practitioners will help SAMHSA accomplish this mission. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I'm pleased that this resource guide is now available on the SAMHSA website. I encourage you to go there, download the document, read it, share it with your colleagues. And while you're there, you can also check out um, SAMHSA's LGBT dedicated webpage um, we have many other resources for LGBT youth and adults. Um, we have a resource toolkit. Uh, we have uh, videos about the impact of LGBT homelessness on behavioral health and many other resources. So thank you very much. I'm pleased that this uh, resource guide is now out there for you and your colleagues, and we hope you'll utilize it um, today and in the future. And last but, but not least, we know that um, the folks in this room, and indeed educators and, and social workers and counselors around the country, are not, not all from big cities, where um, there are often um, many more resources available. And so that's why we're especially proud of some of the work that Ashley and the team at the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture have been doing to ensure that our, our folks in, in more rural parts of the country are taken care of. So I'm very pleased that she's here to tell you a little bit about the work that they're doing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. 
morning. Morning. I know it's early. It's, I know it's early. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Gottman, as well as especially thank you, HRC. To each and every one of you all that decided to roll out of bed to come be with us, and I'm assuming you're here more so for us than that breakfast back there. Uh, we appreciate you this morning. I, uh, I, as I said, my name is Ashley Davis. I'm the special assistant to the assistant secretary for civil rights. There's no way you can say that three times fast uh, at USDA. And I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Assistant Secretary Joe Leonard, our Secretary Tom Vilsack. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here to share with you the great work the USDA uh, has done thus far, but even more so the work that we hope to do with your partnership. I'm specifically here to talk uh, about uh, 7 CFR 15D, but before I do that, I was told that there is a great deal of, of folks from the South in here. And being a native Nashvilleian, I just wanted to say howdy to all those Southern folks in the room. Uh, it is always a pleasure. Exactly, exactly. You can always bet on the Southern folks to clap for you, whether they love you or hate you. Uh, who knows? There might be some bulldogs in here, but they still love me. I appreciate that. Um, so it's great to be here. Um, to dive right into what 15D does, um, it does it, it, it expands our non-discrimination regulation to include a protected basis for gender identity, which will also include gender expression. So this isn't uh, simply identity, but it's important to include expression. We've talked a bit already about how one acts, perceives, or dresses, and as someone who absolutely has faced discrimination before, based on what someone perceives of me, uh, it's incredibly important. But let me explain to you why this impacts you, um, whether or not you know it or not. A lot of folks think USDA, and automatically they think about SNAP. Uh, or it's formerly known as food stamps benefits. But let me explain to you that USDA is there for you whether or not you are eligible for SNAP benefits or not. This is about building homes. And I say that to explain in, in terms of number. Last year, 23.4 billion with a B uh, dollars was obligated through USDA, through our rural development department, for the purposes of promoting, creating, and restoring homes in rural communities. That's 23 and a half, almost billion dollars. How many of that went to our LGBT folk? Probably very few. And it's not simply our, our, our time to say it's your fault. It's our fault, too, for not getting out there and doing that engagement. And that's why we're here today. The purpose of 15D is to expand these protections so that when that trans woman walks into the, the office, she isn't met with fear or hostility about how she would be engaged. It's important for our youth because there are specific youth rural programs that are engaged, created for the simple purposes of giving our young people something to do in the summer. Those that come from the rural communities that are interested in agriculture, uh, whether it be you know starting your own community garden or you want to figure out what a hoop house is or you're interested in figuring out how to bring a, a public library to your community, USDA is there for that. We're not simply the, uh, the net that catches you, we're also that, that springboard to help you with equity. Um, I'm talking a little bit about homes because I think it's incredibly important to point out uh, that as we travel the country, a lot of folks don't realize that USDA builds homes, and not just in the purpose of building homes, but we are there for rental assistance as well. All of these programs will be immediately impacted uh, by the regulation that I'm speaking about. I talk a little bit about why things are important. I think that that's important, but uh, Williams Institute study came out about a week ago that highlighted uh, one in four adults uh, or 2.4 million people within the last year have experienced a time where they simply could not afford uh, to, to feed themselves or their families. And as educators, as administrators, you understand the direct impact um, that an empty belly can have on someone's ability to learn. It simply does not happen. It does not matter how many great policies we put inside and outside the classroom. If that student is not fueled up and ready to learn, that car is going nowhere. And so USDA is here to help and to partner with you. We've worked with some of the uh, rural community schools and building up their own community gardens, but if you have an idea, an inkling of how USDA might be helpful for you, or you're just not sure of where to go next, I encourage you to reach out to your local rural development office, to your local farm service agency office. If you don't know where else to go, go to the USDA Civil Rights Office and email one of us, because we're here to engage you and your communities. To the young folks in the, in the audience, and I think I'm the youngest one on this panel, so I can, I can grin and say that, <laughs> Um, I want to ex explain how important it is that you're here today. Um, we've all talked a little bit about how much just confidence and courage it takes to step out and say who you are at a young age. 
personally, I, I grew up in Nashville in a very religious com uh, community and family and in a space, quite frankly, where I always felt protected and, and promoted by my family. But I knew that when I finally was going to say that gay word, it might just make somebody cringe. And I'm telling you, it took me almost, I want to say, to my almost 18th birthday to be comfortable with bringing the, the woman I was interested in to the home. But that is an incredible moment, moment, and I wish I had that type of leadership in me at a young age. And it, I tell you what, you may not see it, but there's someone watching you and your courage already and is being improved and, and, and quite frankly, uh, poised to thrive because of your courage. So I applaud you. If no one else has today, as I think we all have, we applaud you. And um, I, I know we want to get to Q&A, so let me just say two things and I'll hop right off and I, I'll stay to it. I've talked a little bit about the rural youth loans. I talked about the um, rural youth development grants. But if you know teachers, administrators, you know of someone who wants to go to veterinary school, a veterinary, become a veterinary. And it's really important to know that USDA will pay for their schooling uh, if they agree to, after, directly after school, to work with large animals. Seems crazy. There are grants for folks who are interested in uh, going back to their communities and building single family dwelling houses, those flat top motels and hotels you see in communities. There are mon there's money sitting in a pot here that's ready for our LGBT youth, our LGBT communi communities, our organizations to engage. But the, the question is how do we uh, encourage and uh, empower you? Uh, two things, this summer uh, the US USDA will be engaging in an LGBT rule um, summit. Uh, we'll be traveling around with, the, with, F, with RD, with FSA, as well as uh, different uh, organizations within the federal government to engage with uh, the rural communities. I, I think that this is probably going to be the largest type of engagement that's taking place in the rural communities, but we're excited about it because we don't uh, want, we don't want folks to think that all the gay folks live in the city. I mean, it, it ends, ends up thinking and feeling that way when you come to New York and you come to D.C. I mean, we're around it all the time. Um, but this, this LGBT flight has got to stop. And we should feel encouraged to stay within our communities and, and build them up. So with that, I'll, I'll be quiet, mute this mic, and say thank you guys. So I hope this gives you a sense of the, the passion and the commitment of the folks who I had the pleasure of working with across the administration. Um, we want to get to some questions, and one that I'll start with, because it's an easy answer, is, is someone asks, where do I find all these resources? Because we just threw a lot of information at you. So what we're going to do is actually put up a blog post on the White House website on probably Tuesday that lists everything that we just talked about. So rather than having you run to a bunch of different places, hopefully you can just go to one place. And so it'll be at whitehouse.gov slash LGBT. So it should be easy to find. Check later this week, and it should all be there. Um, I want to see if there's any questions in the audience. I see a hand over here. Do we have a mic we can run over? If not, if you just want to speak loudly, and I'll repeat the question back to the audience. The schools to report incidents that resulted in disciplinary action. So if a bullying incident was reported and it was handled without some sort of discipline toward the aggressor, then that information didn't go to the district. And sometimes if a child who was bullied couldn't identify the aggressor, then those is incidents weren't reported either. So the total number of bullying incidents reported to the district was a gross underrepresentation of the actual bullying incidents that were occurring on campuses. Yeah. So I'm just wondering Great. if you have plans to address those kinds of issues with the data that you're collecting. And just so folks in the audience here, the first part of the question was about the challenges around data collection and um, whether or not LGBT students will actually report um, bullying. Michael, do you want to take a stab yeah, at this? Yeah, I mean, you've definitely hit on, on some, some pretty key issues. Um, 
First, we think it's really important that we start changing the conversations around school districts in the country and that we start collecting this information. We start making folks aware of their obligations um, around sexual orientation and around harassment and bullying. So you, you've definitely identified you know, the, the, the challenges, but we think it's critical that we start having those conversations and changing the dialogue. Um, you know, kids you know, uh, may not report the bullying, um, because the, you know they don't want to get outed. But what we need to do as educators is make sure that all of our kids feel safe, that they have a place to go to, that there's a, an adult in the building that they can go to, that there's a safe place that they can go to, that they can report this and feel comfort. And then talk it through with the teachers and, if, and you, know, the, the, you know, ensure some anonymity or however we can do it. But at the, at the end of the day, it's really making sure that the kids know that there's a safe place to go and that there's an adult in, in, in the building that they, they can turn to. There's no question about it that this will be underreported. But again, it's just about starting the conversation and providing some data that we can really make a difference in local communities. And as we build, provide guidance, you know, uh, technical assistance and how to actually make it happen um, down the road. So another question we got over, over Twitter um, from John is, how protected are new federal policies? If a new, less friendly administration came in, could these advances be rolled back? Um, Aaron, do you want to take a step with that? I actually can't hear you. Yeah, I'm I couldn't sorry. hear you. Oh, you can't hear? Yeah, I can't. Oh, are you worried that the, the type of activity will go away in a different administration? So the question was, oh, could, it, could a less friendly administration, yes. That's a, a interesting question. I think um, I'm coming from a unique perspective in that Hearst has been working on bullying since 2001. This doesn't seem to be an issue that's partisan in any way. Um, I think what's clear is the research. The research is driving this. Um, it's um, clear that there are, like I said, negative health and academic impacts for youth who are bullied. Let me also say it's clear that there are negative impacts for the youth who are exhibiting the bullying behavior. A lot of times we focus a lot on those who are victimized, but we also know that bullying can be seen as an opportunity for intervention for the youth who's perpetrating. Um, and it, they're often being victimized themselves. Um, so I guess to answer that question, if I heard it right, I'm not too concerned that this is um, that this has a finish line at this point. I, I see this work continuing to evolve, um, again, sort of founded upon research. I hope our Institute of, Institute of Medicine work, um, which will really sort of validate and summarize that the state of the research, again, on bullying, will help sort of feed the fire to continue this work. Um, I, I'm excited. Yeah. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Ashley. I just want to add as well, something that, um, USDA is in the most conservative spaces in the country, and we are aware that we don't know what tomorrow brings, meaning 2016. We pray, but we just don't know. Um, and so with that in mind, we have uh, developed training modules that will be uh, embedded into the USDA long after you know I have to clean out my desk as a political. And so uh, the idea is to have these type of protections ingrained, not just in the politicals that served in certain positions, but also, most important, with the career. Uh, individuals to serve at these respective agencies so that, quite frankly, it, anyone that comes in there that tries to strike that down, they should be, they feel ashamed to even think that that's a protection that they could remove, whether it be bullying or the substance abuse or that of gender identity protections. And to that end also, um, it's the support of individuals out, you know, quite frankly, the constituency, the American public that holds uh, these leaders to the fire, whether they are blue, red, green, or otherwise. Um, it is really important that uh, bar be set and stays there. You know, just, just quickly, you know, as Aaron said, right, keeping kids safe and bullying is not a partisan issue. There's no question mm -hmm. about it. Um, that being said, the stuff that I, you know, talked about is definitely policy interpretations. And this administration, has taken this set of issues very, very seriously and, and, and aggressively and proactively. All that to say, who knows what may come, as, as Ashley said, in, in, in the coming years, but the tools are here today. The resources are here today. The guidance is here today. And frankly, kids can't wait anyway, right? They need it today. So we're doing everything we can to, to provide you guys with the resources and the tools to make kids safer, take advantage of them while we got them. 
So another question over Twitter, and I think this might be our, our next to last one, so if you got a question, please tweet quickly, um, is the federal support is great, um, but how do we as advocates work best with municipal and state level governments? Who wants to take a stab at that? Please. So, uh, you know, just, you know, as I mentioned, right, like, so one, one piece of guidance that we put out around kids with disabilities and bullying, you know, was really, you know, tailored to, obviously, to kids with disabilities and bullying, but, a, you know, so this is federal policy that went out to, to, to stakeholders, and as I said earlier, an advocate, a parent advocate, was able to go to her local school district with this guidance, with this document, and say, this is what the law requires. We also have resources. You know, we, I talked about the discipline guidance that we put out around making sure that you know, kids of color and kids with disabilities and LGBT youth are not disproportionately subject to discipline practices that keep them out of the classroom. But we put forward these set of principles that keep schools safe and, and prevent behavior issues and address school climate issues. And there's a ton, a ton of resources. Use this, use this information and go to your local school districts, go to your state educational agencies, go to your governments and say, this is the law, this is what's required. Yeah, can I, I also want to add that um, I think every community will be unique in terms of where, what your next step is as an advocate. Maybe you still are in awareness raising, and maybe what you really need is the, the people to come to the table and say, all right, bullying isn't a rite of passage, I'll take it seriously, let me hear what you have to say, what are your ideas? Or maybe you're at a point where you have a, a state policy that's in place that in fact may have some unintended harmful effects and your role as an advocate is to go back to the table and say, I need you to, to help me tweak the way that we're approaching this state policy because I need to educate you on a potential negative outcome. Um, one, one of the tools, again, that I talked about was that training module that's on stopbullying.gov slash training. Um, that community action toolkit includes um, some tools for hosting a community event like a town hall that might be a venue where you could begin to gather these stakeholders together. Um, it includes a sample agenda for what that might look like. That training module itself is actually a PowerPoint that you can just pull down you can pluck out the sections of it that are relevant to the needs of your community. You could use it as a, a launching point for discussion, or, again, around integrating the best practices um, into your local or state level. So I'm hopeful that that's a tool also that you can have to move that needle forward. So there, there's one last question. I think we're almost out of time. So um, We have one question in the audience. Oh, please. My name is Julie, and I'm a doctoral student working with a district in the western U.S. where there's already been a federal finding of hostile harassment for LGBTQ youth. One of the remedies that this district needed to undertake was to work with what was, I believe, called the Regional Equity Consultant. And these are, I guess, organizations that every few years uh, put in for a, a proposal to provide these services across the U.S. My understanding is that the definition of an equity consultant or a diversity consultant for this role for the Department of Education is so broad that someone might qualify, an organization might qualify if they provide service to English language learners, but not specifically LGBT youth. So this particular district has been asked to work with them when there's no expertise within this agency. And I'm wondering if there's any consideration of looking again at that process of how services are delivered. So I, I'm not too familiar with this system. I don't know, Michael, if you are, but um, why don't we do this, is if you can find us afterwards, we'll stay, we'll come find you over here, um, and we can, we can get you a better answer on that. Yeah, and, and just, you know, again, you know, as a reminder, as a tool, here is the guidance, here is the federal law, you know, here's the interpretation of the federal law, and if they are not meeting the requirements of that policy, then hopefully you can use it as a, as a lever to say, you know what, this isn't sufficient. This isn't meeting these requirements. This isn't meeting our obligation as a school district because it doesn't ensure that kids, LGBT youth, are, are free from harassment. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you. Um, please join me in giving a, a round of applause to these terrific folks who I, I get to work with. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you so much to Aaron, Ashley, 
Brian, Michael, and Gautam, who also had to go through a lot of weather issues, as you know. But they, uh, at one point, none of them were going to be able to make it because all flights canceled. But they worked some magic, and they booked, and then they rebooked because I think some of them had two cancellations. Um, it, even I know some of you did as well. And I just want to give them an extra round of applause because it was important for them to be here. They, they felt it was really important to be here. And so thank you. Uh, and for the young people in the audience know, I mean, these individuals represent uh, U.S. federal agencies. Their voices um, are, are so important here, and I hope that you uh, got something out of what they said. You have so much support, not only in this room, uh, but in the U.S. federal government. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and uh, I want another round of applause for them, please. Thank you.